Cool. So I'm glad. I'm very excited to be here. This is actually my first time in Germany, and my flight got canceled. And I was like, if I am late to my first talk in Germany, it will be the end of me. I was terrified. So I'm very excited to be here with all of you, see so many friendly faces. Um, so I'm Mike. Uh, I work for a university called the Rochester Institute of Technology. We are a university in upstate New York. Um, we've been doing uh, open source programming within the university probably since 2009. Uh, now we have an official academic minor in open source. Uh, we also have an open programs office, which I work for and am the associate director for. Uh, all of my various email contact information is on this slide here. I will also put a URL shortened link uh, to the slides, which will be open for anyone to peruse through and get links. Uh, so today I want to talk to you about uh, something that we do with helping build open source communities around various types of open work projects. Um, but before I do that, I do want to give a bit of acknowledgement because uh, you know, I stand on the shoulders of giants, and certainly with the work I'm presenting here today, I would like to highlight uh, two people in particular who are both uh, student employees within our program. The first is Django Skorupa, who I believe will be remotely presenting uh, a talk after this at two. Come in. <laughs> um, and actually did a lot of the original work on these slides a while back, and I used a lot of their work. Um, the second is Daechon Kim, who was another employee of ours that did a lot of the work that I'm going to be showing examples of. Um, this is just a very, very, very small set of the amazingly talented students that we get to work with and I get to learn from all the time. Um, so if you're interested in hiring, uh, they may be looking for work. Their LinkedIn uh, links are here and the slide links will be up later on. So if you are looking for very talented designers that are very knowledgeable and open source, uh, I suggest you reach out. So as I said, uh, RIT, uh, the, the office I work for open at RIT is an open programs office. So we're dedicated to fostering this collaborative engine of open across the university for faculty, staff, and students within the university. Uh, our goals are to discover and grow the footprint of RIT's impact on all things open. And so this includes you know, everything like open source software, but also open data, open science, open hardware, open educational resources, Creative Commons license efforts of any kind. Uh, and so we like to call this open work. Um, and so I put a link. We've actually created a formal de definition because we've really struggled with this sort of umbrella term. Uh, called open work, and so you can view our, our definition online at openworkdefinition.com. So really when we think about the office I work for, um, we have three main pillars, right? The first is we try to educate faculty, staff, and students through both our official curriculum, uh, which includes uh, our minor and immersion in free and open source software, but also through curated public reading lists uh, that we distribute using Zotero and developing various university policies. So we, we try to educate people within our institution about open, its values, its merits, and also how to like practically do stuff in it. Uh, second, we try to build and maintain dedicated digital infrastructure for helping uh, build and maintain and grow open communities. So this includes things like a Nextcloud instance, Mattermost, GitLab, Grimoire Lab, and more. We work with uh, IEEE SA Open quite frequently um, to help provide like an academic perspective on their platform. And then lastly, what I want to talk about today is we provide a number of individual assistance and consultation services uh, to help build communities around various types of open works, either being produced by researchers within their university as part of their research process, or uh, with like third parties that are just interested in the work that we're doing. And they're maintaining an open project, and they want to better sustain their community or even grow it. So we call this thing our fellowship. Right, because we started doing it with faculty initially, so they'd be our fellows, right? And they come in and they say, "Hey, you know, I'm doing this research, and I'm like building a piece of software, or I'm curating a data set, or you know, I'm designing this 3D model of this thing, uh, and I'm really, really good at it because I'm like super smart and a scientist or a you know engineer or whatever. Uh, but I want more people to be involved with it, and I'm you know." 
I get like I can release it online and you know this is the license I should use, but I'm not really quite sure what else I need to do in order to make sure that my peers can effectively collaborate on this. And so this is what we call you know, our fellowship. We say, all right, well, come here. We got a team of designers and developers, technical writers and community managers, and we'll sort of assess your project and we'll try to build a roadmap about how you can build a community around it, you know, identify the things that you might need, and maybe we can help you um, like kind of deliver on a couple of those things. So, wow, that's very small. I can barely see it. Sorry. Um, so, as I said, you know, we got the standing team uh, of, of, you know, developers and designers to help do this project, and fellows are oftentimes maintainers of a piece of open work, right? So let's kind of dive into the specifics of what we're doing. And you know, I kind of want to break up this next section into two parts. The first is like I want to tell you practically what we do. But then I think more importantly, um, as I was putting these slides together, I want to tell you about like why I think it's really important that we follow this process. Because it's not quite just like, OK, here's a community. Like we gave you a couple things, and you got like some nice documentation. And now you can go off and do your own thing. You know, the reason we do this community development work is actually like a lot of people really struggle with the sustainability of their work and like, you know, kind of carrying it on beyond just a personal hobby. And especially as things grow, the nature of their work really, really changes, and especially in terms of the amount of labor that they can contribute to it. So first, let's talk about like the practical part of this, right? So we help by doing essentially three main things. Right? I'm sorry. I thought this would be bigger. Let me try to. My notes are like not good today. There we go. Cool. So we treat this fellowship as kind of an accelerator for your community, right? And, you know, we have different types of projects that come to us. Some are already, like, you know, already um, sort of like built and they have quite a large community around them. Uh, some are actually quite small and they like only have one or two people, right? Um, so the, the sort of approach we take with them will be quite different, right? With small projects we're helping, you know, we want to figure out how to build a community, how to bring members in. And with larger projects, oftentimes it's more about how to, you know, deal with all this labor that's increasing on probably a fairly small core group of people. And you know, as I said, I want to really um, emphasize here that the projects that we do, a lot of times when people think about building communities, it's around open source software. And you know, I think a, an interesting thing that we found out over the last few years is that like, you know, while a lot of aspects of community building, you know, theoretically, are very similar, uh, with other types of open projects, especially when it comes to the digital infrastructure that facilitates that collaboration. It's very, very different, right? So with open data projects, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure that might support the hosting of open data, sources like Zenodo or Data Dryad or, you know, in a sense, maybe Wikidata. Um, but many of these uh, platforms don't really facilitate collaboration, right? They maybe they'll give you a DOI, which is like an identifier you can use to cite the data. But if you want to contribute, you know, your own data set to that in the same format, like you don't really quite have something as fully featured as a GitHub pull request. And I'm sure, you know, I see a few designers in here. Um, and so we have quite a lot of design tools, but especially when it comes to like, how do you facilitate a design contribution? This is a conversation that we're still having very much today and figuring out what sort of digital infrastructure we need for that. And so we try to make our process of working with uh, our various fellows pretty general purpose, right? We, we want to be able to include all different types of open work. And we do that by taking kind of a, um, uh, you know, a design-focused approach by really saying, all right, let's take a step back and understand, like, what are your goals in terms of, like, your community? And then, you know, what, what's the current process that people are facing? And then, you know, where are, like, the shortcomings and potential areas that we can improve? And so in terms of, like, what we're trying to draw upon to do this is, you know, there's a few main things. And I'm being pretty loose with these citations, but certainly like from top to bottom, 
in terms of importance and influence. The first is Mozilla's Open Leadership Training Series, which is quite old, but still like a very, very valuable resource that you know we use pretty frequently, and we've also seen uh, quite of other, quite a lot of other organizations using. The second is you know Nadia Nadia Eggball's book, Working in Public. We found be really useful and like sort of categorizing various types of communities and understanding uh, the existing sort of common issues that communities face. Uh, and then lastly, we have a sort of design thinking approach um, to kind of trying to you know, approach our problem solving. So what this approach really looks like is you know, we, we break down our, our process into three uh, primary parts. The first is oftentimes, especially as an office within an academic institution, we have to spend a lot of time actually learning about what the work is. Uh, like I cannot begin to explain to you how long it took me to like realize that the project, one project that we were working on, they're me measuring gravity waves from black holes that orbit each other in space using like a big lever thing. Uh, and I guess it's like a super normal, very obvious thing to do if you're like an astrophysicist. <laughs> it took me a while to understand like what, what the data was, how it was being measured, like what's being distributed, how do researchers use it. Um, so we spent a lot of time like actually understanding what the piece of work is and what it means practically to you know the world and those around it. Then once we kind of have like a, an understanding of that, uh, we do like a pretty basic sort of stakeholder mapping and contribution funnel. So this is sort of where a lot of like the Mozilla Open Leadership Training Series uh, comes in. So you know we create contributor personas, right? So like for your project, you know, who who are the contributors? Like what different types of contributors might you have, right? Will you have a documentation contributor? Will you have like an academic research contributor? And then like maybe someone that's working for a private firm. Uh, like, who are these people? What are their backgrounds? What are their incentives for coming to your project? Um, and what sort of like potential skills and resources might they bring? And then, you know, for each of them, we try to imagine what that contribution process is. So this whole, you know, figuring all this out for us is doing a lot. We our primary methodology is doing interviews, right? So we interview existing contributors. We interview friends of the maintainer that are interested but maybe haven't yet. And we try to you know, use these interviews as a way of bringing empirical analysis to you know, driving forward like, OK, what could this community feasibly look like? And then by imagining that contribution process, the whole point of this is like, you know, when we imagine that contribution process is the ideal contribution process, right? This is like you know, when a person first discovers a project all the way to becoming a leader in that project and you know helping maintain it and you know really driving a lot of change. Then we look at kind of what the current situation is and for each step for each contributor what are the shortcomings? What are the things that are preventing the people uh, from actually you know carrying out this process, right? Is it that there's not a good outreach strategy? Is it there's not you know a good like landing page and materials showcasing what the project is which is preventing it from being discovered? Um, is it you know standing up the project and actually just running it in like a development mode, uh, something that's really hindering it? And do we need uh, documentation to sort of showcase that? And so, you know, we essentially try to come up with as many shortcomings as possible to create this huge backlog of like very actionable pieces, resources, and tasks that people could take on to begin, you know, specifically building. Um, you know, the community for that project. Cool. So, you know, some examples of this whole process, right, is I, I wanted to just throw down some, like, basic questions that we're oftentimes asking ourselves throughout this, pro throughout this process, right? So the first step, we start asking about the goals, you know, like, why is being open source important to this project? Uh, you know, how are people currently contributing? Like, you know, what's going on here? Then we start asking about the stakeholders and, you know, um, like ideal contribution pathways. And then finally, uh, we start talking about like 
very specific real things that may or may not exist, right? So what sort of project documentation do you have? Do you have any sort of inbound marketing materials already? Like, do you present this at conferences? Uh, is it on Reddit? Like, I don't know. Like, um, and so, you know, as we, you know, we start very high level, kind of like, okay, you know, what are you about? And we try to get more specific as we go throughout this process so we can land on very actionable items. So this is all fun and good, and it's all kind of high level, but I thought it might be useful to talk about like just one project that we worked with to maybe ground some of these ideas a little bit. So I chose this one. There's a lot of really cool ones. It was very hard to um, find one that was good, but would also fit within 30 minutes. Um, so this project, Autonomous Vehicle Security, uh, Dr. Rostogi um, is a computer science professor. Uh, and so she, her research focuses on essentially like finding out ways to make autonomous vehicles not operate as they should. So it's kind of like, you know, if like you have a, a like a fake sign or the, the, the salt, you ever see the salt circle around like the Tesla self-driving cars? Like, I think that's kind of how I understand it. Um, so there's models for self-driving cars that like help them drive. And then Dr. Rostogi, what her research does is it creates data sets of like scenarios in which um, you know the car, the model might not operate as as expected, and you know, hopefully the models can then evolve to like account for these scenarios and become safer. So, once we found out about all this stuff, it took a while to figure that bit out. Um, but after a lot of discussions, we kind of got an idea of like her work. She wanted to release these models and these data sets to the public so you know other people who are using the open source models for the self-driving car, they can also incorporate her security models to better test it and then improve the open source models themselves, right? So what we did is, you know, the first thing we did is we conducted interviews with essentially everyone that we could find that was associated with her project, right? And so this included a lot of, you know, um, like student researchers, but as well as a couple of people in the private sector that are working on self-driving car models, and then people who are contributing to the open source self-driving car models as well. Um, and so we, you know, predominantly did Zoom-based interviews, sort of discussing them and asking the questions I went over uh, before. And then we created personas for a couple of major archetypes, which were researchers, um, student researchers, so like, you know, kind of professors. Yep. Um, professors, student researchers, private sector people, and so on. From there, you know, we kind of identified a couple of like pretty small introductory roadblocks that were preventing them from like really interacting with the project as they expected. And one of the main things was there wasn't really a good way of distributing a lot of the resources, especially the, the data sets. But you know, the biggest issue was there wasn't like a good home base of material that discussed what her project was and where it sat in relation to other projects. So we realized that this is like sort of a great example of like developing a landing page for a website being very effective as an inbound marketing material. So we built the website, we designed it, we shipped it for her, and um, it's been you know effective, and she's been using it in order to uh, apply for more grant funding and uh, you know further her research. So what's the point of this, right? Like you know, obviously it's nice that she got a landing page, and like we helped her think through about you know kind of who these people are. But I think more importantly, there's like three main issues that we're trying to tackle here as as a team by going through this process. You know, the first is the bigger your community gets, the more complex your development gets, right, regardless of what the work is. And so you need to begin re-architecting how you work and how, you know, decisions are made and information is transmitted across the community as you grow. And that takes, you know, active work. The second is um, community development oftentimes requires skills that aren't really found in our current open work communities, right? Maintainers oftentimes do not have the skill to to go through this process process and like even if they theoretically did you know they're already maintaining the project and it's kind of a whole thing on top of that and then uh you know probably most importantly 
what we found, at least with the folks that we've worked with so far, is that if you if you want to really maintain your community or grow it, you, you need to have like very strong justification to either get your organization or you know especially in the case of researchers, you know, uh, granting organizations like you know funders for research uh, to to justify allocating resources to that, right? So like. You can't be the BDFL forever, right? It's really, really hard. Uh, it takes a lot of work, and oftentimes, like, there's too many things to do as a sole maintainer. So we need to really think about how we split up work between people and who those people are and what sort of contributions you're going to be reviewing and how they all fit together. Um, and we feel that our work helps with that. Second is, in order to figure all of that stuff out, we feel that you know, a design-focused methodology is best for doing that. Um, and so this is why we hire a lot of designers and we use design uh, theory as part of our process. And then third, you know, if you want the money, you got to have a plan. And so this is why every project that we work with, while we do you know, fix some issues, like we made the, the landing page website, we really find that the most effective thing that we deliver is a community strategy, saying, here's all the things that need to be done that are preventing uh, you know, the community from growing and collaboration from happening. And we know this is true because we've done interviews and we've collected evidence and data that shows so. So I believe there is not that much time left, but I do have a question slide and a slide with my slides, and I will be around the next couple days so I can also talk off, off of stage. I don't know if I get to choose or if she should. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, well, thank you for your talk. Um, I have a question about the mapping of the contributors that you have mentioned before. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you have any process for doing that. Uh, do you have any predefined categories and you assign people to those categories, or it depends on the kind of project or the kind of data you are or the kind of community? So it would be great if you can elaborate more on that. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's a good question. So in terms of like the contributor personas, we don't usually have predefined categories um, because we find communities like sometimes it's about the type of organization they're a part of, sometimes it's about skills. Although I will say in terms of the contribution process, we do have standard um, uh, uh, standard phases in that process. And those phases are described in the Mozilla Open Leadership series, and we, we found that they do a really good job of describing that contribution process. I think it's seven steps. The first one's like discovery, first contact, and it goes to leadership. Thanks, Mike. That was a great talk. Uh, in this particular case, uh, this, w this community was born, like there was a new community, but sometimes per perhaps you have suggested that they actually just go into an existing community and share that there, instead mm -hmm. of like creating a landing page, I have this small community that has some overlap, I really just go and contribute this to an existing community. Have you faced that uh, situation where you, your suggestion was exactly that? Yeah, I don't know. There's probably not a ton of time to describe it, but I'll give a very short abridged version. Um, one is a faculty uses this program called P5JS in teaching her students as part of an introductory programming course. And so she has all this educational material that she uses in her lessons. And she said, you know, this doesn't need to be just in my lessons. And so one of our fellowships was with her, figuring out not just how she could best contribute her learning material to the P5JS community, but that you know the P5JS community could also more easily accept learning material from other educators because we know you know especially like with our academic network um, that we could probably like find other people doing similar things. Um, so in in this sense, like our client was the faculty and helping them. But naturally, any sort of open source community that we're working with, we try to kind of improve it uh, for everyone, not just our one contributor. Thanks, Mike, for the talk. Uh, lead into this question is like the topic of mentoring is really important to me. And you mentioned at the end of the talk, like you're also not just trying to do the work for the people, but trying to help give them that roadmap and that strategy, something that they can follow after the fellowship ends. 
So my question is like in that maybe we can look at this example you gave in the slides, but how are, how are you involving the, the stakeholders that come to you to help upskill them or level them up in their own skills to make them more confident in doing these things? Like what's, what does that engagement look like? Like in this case with, that, with the professor you were working with, like how do you help them improve their skills so once the fellowship ends, they, they have the, they feel empowered to go and do these things on their own? Yeah. So in a sense, um, in one sense, we actually don't do that. So in terms of our engagement, we, we engage with our, like, the maintainer um, like once a week, right? But really, our focus is actually filling gaps that they, you know, we, through our engagement, they're learning more about what community maintenance is. But we don't envision them being the sole person to complete all these tasks. And in our experience, um, we, we don't think that that is an effective way of approaching community management by like giving the singular maintainer more and more skills, but rather providing them the ability to learn how to effectively delegate these tasks and making that task list in conjunction with them, right? Because we're always kind of trying to gather data from not just like other maintainers, but from them and getting their perspective on that. Um, so going through that process of creating that plan helps them, uh, you know, better delegate it. But we don't think that they are necessarily the best person to always carry out all those tasks. Ilya? Thanks, Mike. Um, as someone working in non-code in open source, I'm always like, I really want to try to turn everything and document everything just like code. How do you deal with making your work as uh, transparent as possible for other people to research? Uh, yeah, curious on how you deal with that. Yeah, you know, a big part of, oh, sorry, my thing turned off. Uh, a big part of our theory about how to do this is one, um, you know, as an academic center, one, we try to get funding so we can go to conferences like this and present and discuss and make personal connections with people. Um, we, you know, we put a lot of stuff on our website and like it's up there. I think our most effective way of sharing our learnings and methods though is, you know, I found it more effective collaborating with people directly, whether it is like lurking in a lot of different communities and like whenever we do something, we just kind of announce it and talk with people or coming here and sort of talking about what we're doing and being like, hey, you know, I'm interested in all your perspective, right? I'm sure I have like plenty to learn from all of you and maybe we can work together on things. But it's very much more of like this sort of networking thing that we found more effective than, um, you know, we don't publish a lot of like academic papers as a center, at least currently. Um, and maybe that is more effective. Um, and so I know there's other academic institutions that are doing similar things to us as well. They're maybe taking that approach a bit more. Uh, we have time for one last question. If anybody wants to ask Mike something. All right. Yeah, I think that's yeah. it. Thank you so much. Thank you.